Welcome to presentation number two in our series, Rereading Revelation. The title of the presentation today is Approaches to Revelation. And mind you, I do not think this is a presentation of how, or mostly how I think Revelation should be read. Many people have read this book before we do, and schools of thought have developed <clears throat> that we need to be aware of uh, and then see what we would like to gain from those approaches and what we might like to disagree with or even dismiss. Uh, so, <clears throat> what are these uh, schools of interpretation? And what do they see or what do they claim to see? That's what we will ask to begin with. So here is the first one, that's the Preterist School. <clears throat> Preterism refers to the past. And this <clears throat> is that person looking into the past through a magnifying glass. His focus now as a reader of Revelation is the first century. It's the time of the writer of the book. And the claim here is that the focus in Revelation is the first century and events in Rome in the Roman Empire. That's uh, the Preterist school. Now the Futurist school goes to the complete opposite. If the Preterist is the time of the writer, the Futurist interpretation is the time of the reader. <clears throat> that is to say, our time. And so he is turned to the past. Here, the futurist claims that John was oriented toward the future and that he sees uh, the future and sees the future in which we live in so our time. And then you have the historicist school and the historicist horizon is wider because he claims to see uh, the past uh, or the time of John and history all the way from the time of John to our time. So a, a wider horizon, but tending to end in, uh, in the time of the reader. So let's <clears throat> summarize here. Preterist, time of the writer. Futurist, time of the reader, obviously very different. And historicist, history leading to the time of the readers. So there is a bias, a, ten, a trend here that will also put the reader's time into perspective. <clears throat> so <clears throat> more about these schools. What do they read? What's the curriculum that you will find in these schools? And in the Preterist school, there will be books on the Roman Empire about Julius Caesar and the Emperor Augustus and a lot about the imperial cult in Asia Minor and a lot about the life and time of the Emperor Nero. And he is given a role. He is assumed to be a figure in uh, Revelation in the Preterist school. <clears throat> what does the Futurist read? Well, he, he or she reads the newspaper. He doesn't read books. And the reading curriculum of the futurist is much smaller. And it is uh, the news items in our time, late 20th century, early 21st century, and applying the symbols of revelation to events in the time of the reader. And then <clears throat> the historicist, what does the historicist read? Well, he or she reads history, uh, and uh, that history might just go all the way back to the time of John, but it tends to be church history. So maybe one should have, uh, should have specified history, and then church history, and then history also in the time of the reader. So from the time of John to the time of the reader with a tendency to favor the time of the reader. <clears throat> and who are they then in <clears throat> these schools of interpretation? Well, in the Preterist school, they have the best 
credentials. <clears throat> Most academic scholars are, pre are preterists to some degree or other. <clears throat> and again, the focus, Roman Empire and an interest in the Emperor Nero. <clears throat> On the futurist side, few, if any, maybe there are a few academic scholars are futurists. Their interest is the Middle East, used to be communism, and the Battle of Armageddon is a literal battle in the Middle East. And then <clears throat> the historicist, few scholars today are historicists. Seventh-day Adventist interpreters defend historicist tenets. It is actually seen as a badge of honor to be a historicist and uh, a <coughs> criterion for orthodoxy as well. And in the historicist uh, uh, view, you have all of history, but you have a particular interest in church history, Roman Catholic Church, Protestantism, leading down to our time. Obviously, very different horizons. Obviously, the choice of school, <coughs> if you were to make a choice, will determine where you land. And so we need to be very circumspect before we commit to any of these. Well, what do they offer? Let's do a little more of a close-up, especially on uh, the Preterist School, since that may not be familiar to many of those who look at these videos. So the history lesson in the Preterist School begins with the Roman Empire and especially with the figure of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a general, he was a politician, he was a writer, a very good writer, he was a very charismatic figure, a kind of Kennedy-like figure, and a successful general. He marched across the Rubicon, you've heard it, and he marches on Rome, and he becomes emperor. And <clears throat> this is seen as treason in, by the Senate in Rome, because the Roman Empire used to be a republic, not led by an autocratic emperor. So this was seen as treason. And Julius Caesar was assassinated on the floor of the Senate in uh, 44 BC and ostensibly to restore the Republic. <clears throat> so what happened? Well, what happened is the work of this man, Augustus, who was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And immediately when Caesar had been assassinated, he said that Caesar was not a traitor, he was a hero, he was a martyr. So he saves the reputation of Julius Caesar <clears throat> and he becomes emperor himself in a very clever way. First under the image of Augustus as a great soldier who subdues his uh, competition and becomes emperor in 27 BC. Uh, and later more as a priestly figure, a father figure, who is a sort of benign figure. And very cleverly, Augustus pretends that we are still a republic. He is an emperor. His word is the final word. There is no law given that will not be Augustus' law. But he pretends to maintain, he maintains the semblance of republic and is very clever in that way. So <clears throat> this is uh, this time and it is interesting history, whether or not this history is reflected in the book of Revelation. It's uh, sort of something that may be ought to be common knowledge. Now, <clears throat> we owe to the, to the preterist a bit of myth-busting about the time of Revelation. So the thinking in most uh, communities, regardless of school of interpretation, is that the book of uh, Revelation was written during the days of Domitian. And Domitian's dates are uh, 81 to 96. And somewhere in here, John is on Patmos, and he receives the Revelation that we are reading. And 
So this is the time of Domitian. It and Domitian had a was a great builder. This is a an arch here in uh, Asia Minor. This is the <coughs> Domitian uh, uh, Hippodrome of sorts in Rome. These are coins with Domitian's image. And this face here used to be the face of Domitian. <coughs> but those who toppled him, eventually he was toppled. And there was a kind of what they call in Latin damnatio memoria, that you damn the memory of the previous emperor, you try to erase him. <coughs> so <coughs> the head of Domitian was replaced by the head of Nerva, who was a, the general that uh, took over when uh, Domitian was assassinated in, in 96. But <coughs> for readers of Revelation, this is the trick. It used to be said that Domitian was a great persecutor of Christians. And that simply isn't true. Domitian's negative reputation in so many ways was shaped by those who wrote history during the time of his successors, of the successors. And they did everything they could to darken his memory, to malign his memory, and so on. And so was there are a lot of persecution during the time of uh, Domitian, as <coughs> Revelation scholars, Revelation readings have generally held. Not really, not so. It's more complicated. Well, <coughs> what about Nero? Since the Preterists think that Nero is a major figure in the book of Revelation. <coughs> so let's, let's do a little Nero. His dates are 54 to 68, that's A.D. That's the time of the Apostle Paul. And most likely the Apostle Paul perished in Rome during the time of Nero. That is at least a, a very plausible uh, reconstruction. Nero was the adopted son of the Emperor Claudius. And the Emperor Claudius is a direct descendant of Julius Caesar. So he is a Julian emperor. and. Not a great emperor, maybe, but this is, <coughs> he adopts Nero. He adopts Nero because <coughs> he married the mother. He married Agrippina, who was the mother of Nero. And here is Agrippina depicted with Nero, with her son, in an amicable relationship with her son. And here is Nero <coughs> with Britannicus. <laughs> Britannicus is Claudius. Uh, son, blood son, his, uh, his real descendant. Nero is not the son of Claudius, Britannicus is. So here is a depiction found in Asia Minor of Nero in a friendly relationship with Britannicus. Well, <clears throat> here is the true story. So what will Nero do? Nero will arrange to assassinate his adopted father Claudius. He will in an extremely cruel way, arranged to murder his mother, Agrippina. And he arranges to murder Britannicus. And he murders his wife. He has a pretty devastating track record. He is a, a, a his reputation is deservedly very, very bad. And yet he is seen as a figure in Revelation. He is seen as the beast in Revelation 13. There is a wound in that beast and the wound is healed. And this treacherous scholars will say, points to the myth of the return of the Emperor Nero, the resurrection of the Emperor Nero. Most preterist readings are extremely sure about that. Many of you who have who are familiar with the book of Revelation, have never heard it. But this is, there are books and books and books, reams of books about this and the role of Nero in the, <clears throat> in the Revelation. <clears throat> so we have in the Roman times a Roman myth or a myth construct, and it's the myth of the Pax Romana. This is the arch of the Emperor Septimius Severus, who was a North African emperor in, uh, in Rome in the, uh, second, uh, in the third century. 
but there are several arches, triumphal arches, and they are symbols of Roman power. And then <clears throat> we have this uh, altar, that's the altar of peace built in honor of the Emperor Augustus for his <clears throat> achievement to bring peace and stability to the Roman world. And then we have a detail here from the altar of peace, a woman with children, and everything is peaceful, everything is prosperous. So we have prosperity, we have peace and stability, and we have power. Power, peace and stability, and prosperity. Those are the gifts of the Roman Empire to the world. Is it true? Is it true? That's the thing, that's the myth. And the myth has a religious tenor. These symbols evoke religion. God has done something in Roman times. God has bestowed his blessing on the world. And <clears throat> this altar is a religious symbol, of course. And here, this is an image of the Emperor Lucius Verus, who ruled as a contemporary with Marcus Aurelius toward the end of the second century. Here, what is happening here? Lucius Verus is going to heaven and he is accompanied by an angel and he will be installed in heaven, not as a god exactly, but as a divinized figure. The Senate in Rome will vote divine honors for Lucius Verus. So the religious tenor of the Roman Empire is indisputable. Providence is at work. God is at work in the world and the Roman Empire is a blessing to humans and a blessing from God. And here is <coughs> Paul Sanker, uh, a statement and my illustration again is is uh, Lucius Verus, this one you can see in Vienna, uh, this uh, <coughs> his uh, ascent to heaven. Uh, and here is what uh, Paul Sanker will say. Most importantly, through visual imagery, a new mythology of Rome and for the emperor, a new ritual of power were created, built on relatively simple foundation. The myth perpetuated itself and transcended the realities of everyday life to project onto future generations the impression that they lived in the best of all possible worlds in the best of all times. That's how it is. That's how you feel when you are a Roman citizen. Or don't you? That's the question. Is it myth? Is the is this a Roman myth, a kind of religious political myth, this myth of Pax Romana with power here, with peace and stability <coughs> underwritten by religious symbols? And then here is something that is a little different. This is the Emperor Hadrian in the second century, long ruling this was at the time when the Roman Empire was at its largest in, in extent <clears throat> and lots of monuments were built. And I have seen this image, it's in the museum in Istanbul. And what do you see here? The foot of Hadrian is placed on the neck of a conquered subject. The re Roman myth is peace and prosperity. The Roman reality is oppression based on military power and based on the socio-economic advantages of slavery, because one half to one third of the Roman population are slaves. So this is decidedly a myth. And this is a reality that the myth does not show you in a sense, except of course they do take some <coughs> pleasure in showing their power. That's that's true. <coughs> so there is a, a value here. I want to, to say this as a value, as much as I think preterism is inadequate, and it is inadequate, there is still a value by exposing certain things, such as the persistence and temptation of national myths. 
what they project and what they hide. Those are the issues. <clears throat> and I just want to go to our time and look for a second on why this is how this might apply to our time and how preterist readers of Revelation actually see it. Because I have learned this partly by reading history and partly by listening to what uh, <coughs> the preterist readers say. And I have visited Mount Rushmore <coughs> with my family when our kids were small. And this is <coughs> George Washington and this is Thomas Jefferson. I'm not exactly sure how Teddy Roosevelt made it into this, but he did. And this is Abraham Lincoln, who of course preceded Teddy Roosevelt as a, uh, as a president. And there is <coughs> George Washington on uh, horseback, and he's a very noble figure. And here is <coughs> the Jefferson Monument in Washington, D.C. And <laughs> by the way, it looks like the Pantheon in Rome. <coughs> the buildings are similar. What counts as grand in our time, counted as grand in Roman, <coughs> in Roman times too. And then, of course, here is another one. What achievements, what marvels, traveling to the moon, planting your flag on the moon. It's amazing. But it is in some ways part of a national myth. And the reality that the myth projects or, or aspects of reality are not projected by the myth. <clears throat> so there is a fallacy in our myth too. Things that are hidden. Just as the Romans did not like to say that they are a slave-based society, we have not liked to admit that the component of slavery in the sort of building up of our self-image, self-understanding in our time. And I highly, highly recommend a book by Edward Baptist, uh, The Half Has Never Been Told. The Half Has not, Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism. Just to drive the point home, drive the point home. Thomas Jefferson was a slaveholder. So, no, uh, George Washington was a slaveholder in a significant way. Thomas Jefferson was in a big way and fathered many children with one of his slaves in a highly unequal relationship and a relationship only acknowledged much later. And <clears throat> so just to try to set this straight, the New York Times in, in uh, 20, uh, 21, uh, 19, uh, launched this uh, 1619 project. It is extremely controversial in our time. An attempt to admit to the role of slavery in the building up of the new world and the dislike to acknowledge that history. So just as we speak, that is very controversial. But the content of the, pro of the 1619 project is pretty solid. In August of 1619, a ship appeared on this horizon near Point Comfort, a coastal port in the British colony of Virginia. A slave ship just around the same time as the pilgrims had arrived and as the nation was founded. So beware of the national myths. Beware of stories <clears throat> that go like this. And we could then read Paul Sanker again by thinking of our own time and thinking of our own ideals. Some of them very good. Some of them not so good. Some of them absolutely, uh, uh, in some ways, quite despicable. <clears throat> so. Most importantly, through visual imagery, a new mythology of Rome and for the emperor, a new ritual of power were created, built on relatively simple foundations. The myth perpetuated itself and transcended the realities of everyday life to project onto future generations the impression that they lived in the best of all possible worlds in the best of all times. Our time, our country. That is <clears throat> the possibility. And yes, this is a critique offered of 
contemporary realities from the perspective of preterism and its reading of the book of Revelation. And maybe there is something of value there. I had planned not to say much about futurism. I'm actually uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, 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 what should I say? I do not think futurism deserves that much of a comment, but it has a huge, huge market share uh, in uh, America in particular. So some tenets of futurism is that Revelation talks about our time, 19th, 20th century, 21st century. The number 666, 666, 666 is a tattoo to be put on the forehead in a literal sense. The Battle of Armageddon is a conflict over oil in the Middle East. That was the most recent take on that one. Maybe less plausible now because we are getting green energy and oil is not a, as much of an issue anymore. So some of these claims of the futurists are quite short lived. I think this one is more serious. This is a critique written by Robert Jewett, one of the great scholars of our time, especially a great scholar of Rome, of the uh, Paul, Paul and the letter to the Romans. He says that these futurist attitudes, they are attitudes that are resistant to federal authority, hostile to the traditional American politics of compromise, rejecting government controls over the banking and business systems, and profoundly suspicious of international law and peacekeeping. This is how futurist readings actually influences contemporary politics. And yes, there are quite a few members of Congress in the US Congress who subscribe to futurist readings of the Book of Revelation. So that's, <clears throat> that's all I will say about futurism. And I will not say much about historicism uh, now, just give a very brief overview. So what does historicism offer? It looks at a bigger, uh, bigger picture. So this is history from the time of John until the time of the end, with a perception that the time of the end is not far away. So the historicist reader has his eye on the watch, has his eye on the calendar, on the clock, that the time is running out, we're almost home, we're almost there. And <clears throat> a very important tenet in historicism is that the book of Revelation is like the second volume of the book of Daniel, that the paradigm of a history-centered reading is given to us from the book of Daniel and Revelation takes it over uh, and adds to it as a kind of more almost like a second volume or an update on Daniel. And then, as I mentioned already, there is a focus on history, but it is mostly church history and especially Roman Catholic Church and Protestantism. The role of the Roman Empire, the role of Nero that you have in the Preterist uh, the paradigm is in the historicist paradigm in some ways occupied by the Roman Catholic Church and contending with other issues uh, uh, that Protestant theology gives us. And then <clears throat> historicism is also has in common with the futurist that there is a focus on the time of the reader, the time of the historicist reader. The interpreter tends to find himself and herself in the story. Yes, there is this happened, this happened, this happened, but it is what is happening now that counts and revelation illuminates in, in that sense our time. So that's the historicist uh, paradigm. <clears throat> what are flaws or what are limitations here of these schools of interpretation? I may even say, where do they fall short? <clears throat> so they, my illustration here is a clock. It could have been a calendar. Uh, and here is what I mean by that illustration. All these interpretations are time and event centered indisputable. 
that they have that in common, as divergent or as different as they are. And yes, all demand a type of expertise that is rarely achievable for the ordinary person. If you have to read all that historicist, uh, all that preterist curriculum, that is not for the ordi ordinary person. If you have to read the historicist curriculum, it takes a little thing, takes a little uh, work to do that. So that type of expertise is rarely achievable for ordinary readers. And uh, uh, so <clears throat> my third point, uh, there will be a line of demarcation between the expert and the lay reader. We, <coughs> I say, we understand uh, revelation. Uh, we don't understand revelation, but someone in our community understands it for us. We understand revelation in my faith community because we have some experts and they understand revelation vicariously for me. So I believe that my community understands the book of Revelation, even though most of us in that community don't. We just count on our experts to have gotten it right. I don't feel that I'm exaggerating there. <clears throat> and then and there is a kind of silo shape, communal silos here. Uh, you have the silo of the preterist, and the silo of the futurist, and the silo of the historicist. And it's not wrong to call them silos. <clears throat> they are even silos in the sense that the preterists hardly know anything about what the historicists teach and vice versa. They hardly know about the existence of the other community, in fact. And many of the things I have said in this presentation will be new to, to people who belong to one community or another. We have separate approaches and separate communities. For some communities, the futurists and the historicists in particular, the interpretation is a major element in that community's sense of identity. That's how we define ourselves. Those are critical beliefs, how we look at the world and how we read the book of Revelation. And yes, each community knows little about the other communities and might like to keep it that way. Because if you, your perspective is challenged by something in the other perspective, that could be unsettling in some ways. <clears throat> so. This is a problem then. When I talk about these approaches to Revelation, this is a problem. It might just be a deterrent for people to, to say, well, I want to go to the uh, University of Revelation or to the universe of Revelation, to the world of Revelation. I'd like to know what's there. But you have to have these admission requirements. Uh, the preterist requirement the futurist requirement, the historicist requirement, that as you enter, you sort of have to commit to those different schools. And that perspective is in place before you start reading. So they will say, this is how you should read it, preterist. This is how you should read it, historicist. And that could be a deterrent. It could even be a mistake. <clears throat> so let's just <clears throat> look at it take a step back from these schools and look at the book itself and, and uh, uh, the type of claims we have in the book. John on Patmos, who is identified by name in the book of Revelation, I, John, he is a reader. He is not only a seer. He is a reader and a seer. And the text he has read is not the history of the Roman Empire or the history of the world or the history of 21st or 20, 20th, 21st century as in futurism. The text he has read is the Old Testament. The text he has read is the Bible. And he has not only read the book of Daniel, even though he has read that too, he has read Genesis and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah and Job 
and he has immense command of what he has read. So when we try to look at, to visualize sort of what how he works, how he how he uh, puts uh, this together, how he how his being a reader and a seer uh, works in practice. <coughs> We see him here at his desk and he is told to write. There is a command to write and write he will do. But he doesn't use the Old Testament that way, the way I put it here. So I have to put a question mark next to him. It's not how he works. He has it all stored in his head. It is as though the distance between his head and his hand is obliterated. He writes with his, he thinks with his hand. That's what someone has said, and I will quote, I will read that statement, what someone has said. So let's do this again. He's a reader. His text is the Old Testament. He's a seer. What he sees is related to what he has read. He is in some ways aware that he might be writing the climax of history, as Richard Bauckham puts it. The book that will in some ways complete the Bible that begins in Genesis and will end in the book of Revelation. And he writes with amazing command of that text. His subject is theology more than history. His subject is God more than events and how God's reputation and how God's battle against evil will be brought to a successful conclusion. So Austin Ferrer, who was a great and imaginative British scholar, some say he was the greatest New Testament scholar in Britain in the 20th century. He wrote a couple of books on Revelation, and I'd like to read what he, he, he says about <coughs> the way uh, John uh, works. No other New Testament author felt himself called to the same task. No other set himself to capture a visionary experience of the last things, and here is a key, by intense and systematic meditation on the whole prophetic tradition. That's his John as a reader. So far from reading like an attempt to communicate a previous visionary experience, the revelation reads like a fresh and continuous scriptural meditation, conceived in the very words in which it was written down, as though, in fact, the author was thinking with his pen. Amazing. A feat not all out of the way, for have we not all done it from time to time, perhaps when we were writing a familiar letter? and thinking no faster than we wrote. That is a excellent view of John, I think. <clears throat> and here is Richard Bauckham, who was one of my mentors at the University of St. Andrews and who has been a prolific contributor to many uh, uh, current issues in the New Testament and his work on Revelation is quoted again and again. And this is his view, and I agree 100% with it. John was writing what he understood to be a work of apocalyptic scripture, the climax of prophetic revelation, which gathered up the prophetic meaning of the Old Testament scriptures and disclosed the way in which it was being and was to be fulfilled in the last days. It's hard to improve on that statement in my view. So this means <coughs> that the time-centeredness of readings of Revelation, preterist, futurist, historicist, they constrain our horizon ill-advisedly. It's not all about time. There is past, present, and future. And past, not just back to the time of John, but all the way time back to the time of creation all the way back to the time before creation, the, in God's time, as it were. And <clears throat> the focus is human and cosmic reality. Human, that's history, but cosmic, that's theology. That's beyond 
historical events. So there is a, a, a spatial issue there, not just a temporal issue that is bigger. And Revelation is more interested in values than in events. If we understand Revelation's values, we will have a tool, we will have criteria with which to assess events that will be superior to any event-centered approach, looking to the past, looking to the future, a sort of comprehensive view here. That's what my illustration is meant to show. And the arrow all the way back to primordial time and all the way forward to the world made new. That's Revelation's horizon. Finally, a note on who is who in the book of Revelation, because <clears throat> that is also in some ways obscured in readings. <clears throat> there is a tendency, yes, there is God, and there is human reality here in this corner, and <clears throat> there is a non-human reality uh, depicted in Revelation, angelic reality, demonic reality, that is important in Revelation story. Who is who in interpretations of Revelation? Well, mostly God and mostly the human side. Very much the case in the preterist paradigm and also in the others to some extent. To the exclusion of the non-human element, the cosmic element that is so important for Revelation's uh, explanation. So we have the cosmic perspective lost and when I came to St. Andrews, I wanted to read back into the story the cosmic uh, perspective of Revelation, and eventually I won some support for that uh, from my excellent uh, mentors. <clears throat> okay, let's <clears throat> do some conclusions here. The time and event-centered approaches <clears throat> of the leading schools, it, they impose a straitjacket on Revelation, that mutes the book's authentic voice and limits access. It is a deterrent to reading this book, and in quite a few church traditions, Revelation doesn't have much of a role. <clears throat> God, not events, or a timeline is the main concern in the book. To reveal God's name and to inscribe God's name is the book's unswerving purpose. And some specifics. The preterist focus on Roman imperial reality and its critique of national myths are, in my view, matters of value for all readers, even though those readings are not adequate for the story in Revelation. They might still be matters of value. Futurist readings are unmoored and speculative. They tend to affirm the prejudices and political bias of the underlying God and country belief system in large swaths of Christian America. They are not helpful readings of the book of Revelation. Historicist readings have lost appeal because of the passage of time beyond what interpreters led people to expect. And this is my main uh, critique, and deservedly by prioritizing history over theology, events over theology over God. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> the final point, Revelation does not submit to the constraints of the schools. It refuses to stay inbound in its resolve to reveal God and save God's reputation.